Welcome everybody. Recording has started. So again, my name is Diogenes Rittori. This is me on Twitter. Very small, so you don't have to follow me. It's Rittori, R-E-T-T-O-R-I. Uh, I, I think uh, I'm the nerdy enough in the family to own Rittori everywhere. Even .com I bought using my dad's credit card when I was 12. So good. I wish there was a famous, famous singer or something Rittori that I could sell. It. So let's talk a little bit about microservices. And I'm uh, uh, sure all, we all read uh, Martin Fowler's definition for microservices, what it means, what it does not mean. And I want to uh, specific about more of uh, the capabilities that we tend to believe make the things that we do microservices. Um, and for me, these are mainly, instead of, oh, it's the main driven development, it's the size of the application, it's the number of lines. So I don't want to get into that, but more of the surrounding or ecosystem technologies around the applications that we write. And for me, this, if you just ignore this thing for a while, just this for me are, are key to, to getting very close to a microservice or interact tech, which is service discovery, client side load balancing, fault tolerance, and gateway and distributed configuration. And a lot of praise to Netflix is that they did this, uh, implemented this, like I think uh, seven to eight years ago. So all the Netflix test technology that people still use and love today, that was created seven, eight years ago for a world without containers, without Kubernetes, without Docker, where they using they were using certain essentially virtual machines for all of that. But they done all of this. They done all of this, and this was really great work that they did, especially when they started to to open source that. I know there are some guys from Pivotal here that they helped Netflix on that, so thanks for that. That certainly made our world better. So I'm just going to go over and quickly on this uh, concept here, so we can have a baseline, and then I'll go. I'll go to so first thing, service discovery. Like if you are from the SOA days, I think you are probably old enough to be here on the SOA days. Heard of UDDI, Universal Database, Universal something, Discovery something. I forgot what UDDI means. But in the SOA days, there was a discovery mechanism where you would query an endpoint and would say, oh, this is your service. This is where service is. So for service discovery in the microservices world, it's very similar. You ask someone, where are you now? And this is important because people are used to Let's say defining what things are based on IP. So what's the IP of the database? You know, hmm, okay. Uh, what's the IP of that uh, that pricing service? What's the address of that pricing service? How do I get there? And problem is that uh, if you think from a cloud native perspective, things change, right? Today the IP is one. Tomorrow should be uh, should be a different one, right? And so if you ask uh, if you want to know where a service orders is. Probably it's going to be like 0, 01 today, and service order is going to be a different IP tomorrow. So if you stick with IP addressing for identifying or for discovering where things are, uh, that's uh, going to be a little bit complicated. And if you expand on this, uh, if you're developing a service orders, orders for dev, it's one, some, it's one place. Orders for QA, it's in a different place. For a pre-prod, it's another different place. And even for production, when you say that you want orders, that means another, yet another service. It's still an order service. So service discovery and what uh, they, uh, one of the Netflix websites did is that allow you to have like a registry of things. If I want to talk to an order service for prod, where where is it? Now? You know, so you would address things easily. So they they done it very well. Another thing is uh, load balancing. It's very easy uh, to understand load balancing. We all know this, but uh, the perspective that we see for load balancing is uh, it's more from let's say a front end load capacity. Right, you're going. To, you're accessing a website or some, some front end capacity and you expect that load to be balanced across multiple servers. But when you're talking about service to service communication, eh, you kind of ignore load balancing. You know, you worry about the front end of the service, the website, the main page, the global load balancer. But once you reach that uh, entry point, you kind of forget about all the other services that will suffer under load as well. Right? So what they did is that they had a client side load balancing, Netflix has stated client side load balancing. Uh, from the client perspective, so the client would know where all the, uh, the nodes or the servers for a specific service were so that they can uh, load balance the calls between those services. So, so this was good. So not only they had the front door uh, load balance, but also service to service call. Um, now the, the problem with this technology, the way Netflix implemented, is being a client sign technology, it resided inside the application. So you would have to have an implementation for for Java, for Node.js, for PHP, for Go, for .NET. Uh, so there wasn't this one single service uh, client side or uh, load balance. Uh, another uh, important uh, concept for me is fault tolerance. So this is a very simple scenario. 
let's say uh, you have your cart. It's a cart. It's a shopping cart. And in your cart, you need to interact with uh, two services before you, you place an order. First is to get the promotions. And then after you get the promotions, you, uh, you get, let's say, to an order service for whatever it's in your cart. You know? And the way uh, I've seen this and I've done this myself is that, OK, so service promotions, it's not response. So what is the what is the the common the common pattern when that happens? Service promotion is not responding. It's taking time, and then actually a failure in the trajectory. Slides that looks like a failure in the trajectory. So things go bad, you know. Um, so let's say with fault tolerance is that it allows us to query a service a few times. You know, for example, I'm going to try that service three times. And if that service does not respond, I'm going to say that that service is not responding, and I'm not going to keep calling it. Because every single request is going to have to wait for the timeout for a service that I know it's down. Eh, it's, not, it's not so smart, right? So then, of course, uh, you'll be querying every now and then to see if it's come back, back up, right? But this will be the concept of circuit breaker. So once this fails this many times, or after that many tries, you open the circuit, no more calls go to to your, your service promotions. And if they're not dependent on each other for your business case, you can still complete orders without suffering problems in the promotion service. We all got this, this idea of circuit breaking. It's not, uh, it's not uh, the concept is actually fairly, fairly simple. And the result will be like no more waiting for a failure. And this is a problem, right? You know your service is down, and you're still waiting for something that's going to fail. So that's why circuit breaking for me is very important. And another uh, uh, important is gateway. And if you think about Istio and Voy, how they are today, they cannot even be seen as a gateway. Uh, I know there are people from that that contribute on Istio and Voy, so they may may say like, "No, you're wrong." But uh, but uh, they the, the advantage of the gateway is that it allows you to implement uh, in a more let's say centralized manner some of the fault tolerance or circuit breaking and even load balancing capabilities that you would have on client side, right? So if we were to apply the same scenario, right, now you have a gateway that can do load balance uh, from multiple services. So not only service cart is going to load balance directly, or not only service shipping is going to load balance directly, but gateway will also go. And in case, for some reason, uh, service promotion goes down, the gateway know that this thing involved. And now anyone calling that service will say, hey, that, that service is down. So I'm going to give you a, like, 404, I'm going to give you a, a not okay right now instead of having to give you a timeout 10 seconds later. You know? So this is, this is, and the difference is in experience. You know? um, yeah, okay. So, and then configuration, that's pretty obvious, you know, like what information do I need in order to run? But in a, uh, in a DevOps or CI, CD oriented model, it's more complex. It's not only like uh, what's the, the address of the things I need to connect. Because as you move workloads across multiple environments, they should feel the code should the code base should always be the same, but configuration that pertains to that particular environment should be provided by someone. So as you move from prod to from QA to prod, the code should be the same always. But someone should be saying, okay, now you're supposed to run with the prod config and not uh, having to change code and create and run with a prod code. Question so far? Was it too fast? Yes. Okay. So gateway implements the the capability, some of the capabilities that I mentioned before, uh, and it's a pattern. So the gateway pattern, like load balancing and fault tolerance, but outside of the application. So before, and this is I'm essentially explaining like Netflix or that that code that will do this thing, like load balance, for example, it's inside the app. Yes, it's outside, yes, 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 yes. It's a general gateway, I would say, it's a general gateway. It, we see that implemented in API gateways, but if you see gateways for other technologies, it's, it's, it's a general gateway capability to do that. You could, yes, you could have, and it's it's uh, since since uh, there are often different companies that do them, and different providers. 
you normally see multiple gateways in place, even though they're not necessary, which is why I see so much value in, in, in Istio and Envoy, is that you can get rid of five to 10 gateways that you have in order to have just one. So if you have an API gateway, then a load balancer, then a service mesh gateway or a service mesh proxy. What if they could be the same? That's my view. So the Netflix for Access technology that I created is awesome, right? But as I said, it's eight years old. Um, not, not, not saying that old technology is bad, but uh, uh, it, it, it can get better. So there is opportunity for evolution in that. It's, uh, and it's language specific. So that means that the clients, they are specific for a certain language. So, so there's a library for Java. There, there has been some implementation for other platforms. It, it, uh, it relies a lot on the developer. And if you have a company that's only like A or 10x developers, that's OK, because you can trust the developers to do that. But the majority, so let's say the traditional nine to five developers, uh, it's a lot of responsibility to put on them to also care about the infrastructure level uh, components of the application. Right? So if a developer forgot, for example, to apply or to add uh, the load balancer or fault tolerance, um, you will either have to do that during your CI CD pipeline to verify that during your CI CD or some other test, but then still being it mostly client side technology relies a lot on the developer. And um, this is very specific about Netflix for that. The not, not everything that they do on this project that I mentioned, it's under maintenance anymore. It's technology that was great when it was invented and it was uh, it's still, still very useful, right? But not everything is in maintenance. And on the Istio community day that I attended in Sunnyvale, I think uh, know, six, seven weeks ago, they were on stage saying, manifesting their interest towards Istio and Envoy. So like even then, they recognized like we did this, it was great, it really helped us, it was awesome. But when it's time for something else, something different. Now. So um, uh, accomplishing like all the Netflix uh, technologies that are created is pretty good. Uh, the new thing I want to talk about, not so much new, and we're in this, so. Um, Sponsored by 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 microprofile a little bit, is that uh, there there's a group of companies, uh, uh, IBM, Red Hat, uh, Fiara, Summit Tribe, that they want to create. They are creating a specification for uh, micro Java microservices application. So again, language specific, platform specific, but uh, somewhat of a let's say JEE spec for microservices that will address also circuit breaking, uh, fault tolerance, balancing this. Uh, with, with a standard that others would implement. So with the spec, like both Red Hat and IBM and, and, and the other vendors that have a JEE server or a Java server, they would implement the same spec and users should expect the same. The same. So this is a microprofile.io, the website. And um, again, this is specific for Java. If you're a Java developer, if you're essentially Java, Java shops, pretty good. No, this is this is one of the. It's not. There's. It's under the Eclipse Foundation, um, and this is one. Uh, so the the group behind Microfile wanted more speed in, in addressing new uh, new use cases for the Java platform. So that's why they created this. So it's not a JCP. It's uh, it's a set of APIs, and there are some reference implementation for the APIs as well. Good. Now enters Envoy. Uh, but, uh, Christopher, where are you? You know the exact color code for the list color. <laughs> I googled that, and it's this one. Yeah, it well, I mean, according to my research, it's this one here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so and then like enters Envoy, and you have a like uh, people that actually participate in this. Uh, what you know, there's uh, you could make sure all communication went through this piece of, of software that can see and control everything. And if you have not seen Matt Klein's presentation around explaining what Envoy is, I think he's explaining it right now to another audience. I really recommend it was on the event uh, managed by uh, uh, Richard from DataWire. It's a one-hour session that I believe everybody should see. It explains the rationale behind Envoy. And uh, for me, what caught up most was that if you can't actually see it, you won't be able to, to do anything to operate it or to, 
to to to, uh, to provide support. So they're very keen on on tracing calls, very keen on understanding everything that happens on a call, right? Um, just, just a few pointers. I know that uh, what that team published that uh, uh, Lyft runs more than 100,000 servers. I think more than 100 microservices. So it's a big number in terms of um, servers. Not so big numbers in terms of the number of microservices, actually, right? It's, it's common, like Red Hat working on the enterprise, it's common to get to a company and say, like, we have 6,000 apps here. If you were to break them into 10 services each, that would be 60,000. Right? So, so there are still things that I believe uh, there, they have, there's opportunity for a lot of evolution in both Eastern and VoI is to, to handle more, uh, uh, not, not necessarily load, but more configuration. So yes, so this is the big brother. It's it's watching. So the, the, the envoy, it's like the big brother. It's uh, all traffic going through this one central place. Sorry, all traffic going going to this one piece of technology that is spread across your uh, network or a mesh, if you would say. And it's yes, it's pretty much like the dog. So I decided to do this. So uh, in the uh, red big brother or the the the, the, the like 1984 big brother is watching you. They said, like, who controls the, the past, controls the future, who controls the present, controls the past. And I say, who controls the traffic, controls the access, who controls the routes, controls the traffic. So that was my parallel that I did with Envoy to try to explain that. It's, it's going to control traffic means how many times can you do this operation? Who are you? Can I trust and also the routes? Like, who should I send you to now? Um, yeah, when I created this slide, this was funny again. <laughs> Man, this would be a very nice joke. No, of course. All right. So it's still a little bit of Istio. That's uh, we have, I have like 15 minutes. Hopefully my demo will be good. Started by M Google and Lyft. Thanks to people from IBM, Google and Lyft that are here. Uh, a lot for also open sourcing this to the world. Awesome. I uh, love this. And uh, the the announcement was made on May 24. And other companies like uh, pretty much I think they're all here except for Tiger and WeCloud. That uh, were all represented here. Uh, that were part of the launch. So DataWire was, people thought it was here, where it had was part of the launch as well. So yay, thank you. So Istio, what does it do? Pretty much uh, similar to some of the Netflix OSS technologies, but in a different way. So service discovery, load balancing, fault tolerance, it is a gateway, it has distributed configuration, can be rating, limiting, authentication, authorization. The pieces of Istio are, are this one represented here. Um, uh, the most important point, I guess, is, is, is to understand that in every uh, container that you run on in every call, it's going through a proxy all the time, right? So if you're talking to a web from web servers, web service to another web service or to a REST endpoint, the calls are made between the proxies. A proxy talks to another proxy and then reach out to the service. So that is, let's say, from a technical standpoint, that is the main, uh, I think, uh, architectural difference of, of the service mesh. That the proxy, it's in every communication and knows every communication. If I'm lying, please let me lie alone. Help me on my lie, okay? Uh, good. So and there are other components. Istio auth, responsible for authentication. So Istio today runs on Kubernetes. So it's going to read service accounts from Kubernetes uh, and see if you can do something, you know? Um, Mixer is the... Uh, Oh, there's a there's a new one. I forgot to put Galley there. Galley for integration. This story is is uh, also on the API that you talk to to execute the operation. And it's 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 the place where Envoy goes to verify what are the policies, what are the things that should be applied in authentication, right? Uh, pilot for configuration. They they added Galley also for configuration. Uh, not here. I got it yesterday. Okay. So. Pilot was called Manager, I think. They just changed the name from 1.5 to 1.6 to, or 0.15 to 0.16 to Pilot. But it's important. There is a proxy in every communication. There is a proxy in every communication. This is, this is the key point here, okay? Right. And from a deployment perspective, I'm gonna show you a little, just a few minutes, what's happened. So this is the part where it's gonna get complicated. Because I'm going to try to show you my the things I'm doing on my phone. That's a little small. So, sorry, I'm gonna have to do this. Okay. 
All right. So, of course, I have my very nice script document. Too many screens. So uh, the demo that I'm going to do uses Docker machine. I'm going to do some from scratch. Well, not 100% from scratch. I already have a Docker machine uh, create, so that I don't have to recreate the Docker machine. So I'm going to be using uh, Kubernetes 1.5. 1.5 for the demo it should work on 1.6, and it should work on 1.7 as well. The main changes it's been on third-party resources uh, in Kubernetes. Uh, I'm actually going to use OpenShift for this, but be aware that OpenShift is just Kubernetes with more things in it, okay? So all the command line, you see I'm using OpenShift command line, but it can be the exact same command line for uh, that. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. The good thing about live demo is that they are always great. All right, so I got my Docker machine on, and I'm going to start an OpenShift cluster with, uh, oops. You'll see how hacky I am right now. All right, so I'm going to start a, an OpenShift cluster. The version of OpenShift that I'm using is 1.5.1, really. It's the exact same. It can be, yeah, and it would work exactly the same on Minikube. It's mini. It's not mini shift, but it could be mini shift. The problem when you want to do like everything from scratch, you know, you could have just have the environment running, but then first level goes down when you have like everything ready to go and just do the oh, see, you routed to the different version. So this hopefully will bring uh, an OpenShift environment, uh, the version 1.5.1. Yes, it did. Uh, I'm going to add a lot of policies. This is the thing. So there's a so the OpenShift uh, by itself, when you when you install it, or even when you run like OpenShift locally on your machine, it comes with uh, it comes closed, right? So you can run root containers that require root. It doesn't allow you to do crazy things on the environment because that's what we believe our customers should do. You know, they should uh, have environments that are protected. So in this case, I had to allow a network policy on C group uh, that uh, it's going to allow an IP tables execution so that every all the traffic in the pod goes first to Envoy, goes first to the proxy. Sorry? No, so the, 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 the IP tables that it's going to be written, it's inside the pod. So the communication in the pod, inside the pod, uh, it's going to say all communication in this, in, this, in this pod, inside the pod, is going to go through this 
this other container, this proxy. So the same pod, there are two containers. And I'm going to talk a lot about, about, about this. Okay. But it's good. All these questions there are very good. So again, more, uh, this is, yeah, this part I, 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 I was when that everything is from scratch, lot, added, uh, lots of service accounts to allow things to happen. Um, now I'm going to actually deploy Istio itself, Prometheus, Grafana, a service graph, and Zipkin. Not sure I have time to, to show Zipkin, but uh, I'll deploy that as well. So the first thing is Istio. And then uh, Prometheus, and then Grafana. And then Z. So I'll, I had all the Docker images already uh, loaded on my machine, so that's why I can see. So if I come here and I see, yeah. So this is my uh, OpenShift cluster or Kubernetes cluster. You would like to see. So it's like uh, get pod, cut off, get pod, same thing. So see, get pod has a little bit more data in it, so or it's not so well, uh, but it's the same thing. So I'm, I'm interacting with the same cluster. Okay. So another thing that I'm doing, if you know OpenShift, I'm doing everything on the project called default because in OpenShift we have a concept of network uh, uh, network namespaces and uh, for multi-tenancy. In a traditional OpenShift environment, you wouldn't have access from one project to another. They are they are isolated tenants. But the project, the default on OpenShift, can see everything outside, can see anything on any project. So the, uh, the deployments that I have here are uh, two deployments. OpenShift has a Docker registry. We also have a router, which is our, ver our version of, of Ingress. But we also have, especially if I make it bigger, you'll be able to see better um, here. So we also have this deployment. So these are Kubernetes deployments. They are not deployment configs, as we call in OpenShift. They're Kubernetes deployments. And these are all things that represent um, uh, the technology. In ETL, the ingress needs to manager. So the manager, as I mentioned, changed its name to pilot. So now I'm going to install, or sorry, to just to uh, uh, install the demo application, right? So these are the things that Istio needs to do. So I'm going to install now a demo application. And as you can see here, more, more deployments were created. Uh, this is where it gets more interesting, right? So you can see, uh, you can see here on the right, this figure that you have more deployments. You have now a product page, uh, a reviews page, Three versions of reviews, a ratings, and a details page. So these are all Kubernetes deployments. And if you go to resources and, and uh, sorry, applications and pods, you see that uh, some uh, some deployments they are they're coming up, but they have two containers, right? So this is the thing. When, as I said, all communication happens proxy to proxy. So when you deploy your application to be a Java application, in this case, I think the reviews. They are Java applications, but everything else is, um, I, I think it's an old and Ruby application. But inside your pod, there are always two containers. One is your actual application, and the other, it's the proxy. So we can see this. We can come to a pod. Let's take this one here, for example. Uh, we can go to logs. This is uh, the review service. These are logs from the review service, and these are logs from the, from the proxy. So these are all things generated by import, right? Uh, we could open a terminal and them as well and do things, but uh, no, no need to do that. Um, all right, also we have auditing in this server. Okay, cool. So, and another thing that happened here, let me see if I can show this in the pod description. Um, so, not here, but uh, get pod. Get 
So in, inside this plot description, it's very hard to, to, to see right now. Um, sorry, I know why. Oh, no, correct. So there's, there's this init container, right? So init container is something that was added recently to, to Kubernetes. It's, uh, it's something that it's run right after a pod is created. So the first thing on the life cycle of the pod is to run the init container. And this init container is that's going to make the IP tables call for that pod and say all communication is going to the proxy, whether you want it or not, right? Uh, so there is a init container. So it's a container that spins up, runs once, changes the configuration IP tables for that specific pod, goes down, and this, this, this pod has two containers. One is the actual application container, and the other is the, the actual, uh, oh man, I'm gonna need more time. I'm gonna need this, I'm gonna go over a little bit. Some more hacky stuff here. So what I'm doing right now is just uh, uh, I'm using ingress and I'm, I'm routing the ingress port in Kubernetes to a node port. So that means that my OpenShift server, my, my virtual machine, is going to respond on the ingress port on this port that I just used here. So this port is a node port. I'm not using DNS or any route. So if I reach that, uh, that IP, I'm going to get the ingress router, which is also an envoy, right? So the first time I hit the servers for my application, I'm already hitting Envoy. I'm already hitting proxy. That means from that point on, all communication is going to go already through the mesh. And you'll be able to have first traces from the moment you get into the platform to the moment it goes out. Yes. Uh, the ingress is, so the ingress is for the cluster itself. All ingress in the cluster. Not just yeah, so and could be and not just for a specific service, right? So I'm 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 getting the ingress to the cluster, so I'm getting in the cluster, and from that, the router will just will the the envoy proxy will define what service we want to access. You see this? Right? This is this was just to facilitate DNS actually. This was just to facilitate DNS. So I'm mapping I'm mapping the ingress uh, the ingress uh, IP to a uh, to a node port. Did I answer your question? That's just easy for demo purposes. Yes, under, that, that, that makes sense. But uh, since I'm going to use ingress to the router, and the router is going to then send traffic to the multiple services that I have. Yes. Router is a pod. I'm sending, I'm sending a node. Or pod that is the router actually. So doing uh, whatever. Okay. Uh, up. Yes. Yeah. Just make it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm outside. So this is my Mac accessing the machine, the server. You know, I'm not SSH this week. I'm from the outside of the machine. Okay. Uh, so uh, okay. Okay. 200. So it's working. So now we can test the application. So it is slash the port again, three one three one eight zero one slash product. So this is a demo app, right? Yeah, hopefully I'll be able to show more. So the demo app, it's a very simple application that is using multiple services and it's getting, uh, it's getting reviews from uh, different pods. So there's, a, there's a, a review service. There are actually three versions of a review service and then each time I refresh this page, 
I get a different version of the review service. So now I got the review service that has scholars. Now I'm getting a review service that no review service. Now I'm getting different review service, right? So and this is the, the route. This route is being done by, by Easter. That in this case, there are three services, three pods under the same Kubernetes services, and they are all being, let's say, the, the traffic load balancing. There's no specific policy being applied there. So the proxy is just saying, yeah, just load balancing the two, the two, the services that are there, and we're fine. Now, if you want to send, for example, all traffic to V1, you can as command here. And I'll show you what it is later. That all traffic is going to be sent to V1. So whatever takes a while to refresh. So whatever V1 is, which is probably nothing, nothing, I'm requesting all traffic to V1. So So there's a route rules for rating. So let me see what this route. So see, there's a route rules that were created. So now I have that from the product page. I have a route rule, patient review, yes. So I have, all, I have a route rule that's sending all traffic to V1 of my rating service. So this is, for the destination me being rating service, I have Everything being sent to V1. So I changed the configuration, all the proxy is sending that. So it, it is working, there's nothing there. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to change the rule and send all traffic, so the traffic for a specific user to a different uh, route. So this is the command, it creates another rule. So in this case, if I log in as user, uh, I think this is says Jason. That means that uh, I logged in as Jason. I now have a rating service. So if we go again and show the route rules, the new route rules that we created, now there's this uh, regular expression that's looking something in the cookie. If the cookie has the username JSON, it could be anything, uh, it's going to send that to V2. So the, everybody that, uh, uh, when, whenever this matches, is going to send that role to V2. Uh, again, this is because there's a proxy that's controlling and managing all the communication from point to point. It's doing this right now. Yes. Yes. They are. They are. It, it takes. It takes. Uh, it's. It's not a. It's not a, a atomic distribution. So there will be some inconsistency between uh, between the time you execute this command and until all endpoints get updated with that. Right? I'm sure. Um, I hope. I, I would think there are ways to do it in atomic manner, but then you get into consistency problems just like you get anywhere else. Ah, oh, it's pretty fast. It's it's less than seconds, less than seconds, because it's the time of following the mixer with the configuration and and getting the proxies updated. Um, I mean, any API management tool has this problem or characteristic today, you know. And what uh, you decide is that I and this is let's say one of the things that uh, Netflix would do is say like, ah, I think it's better to allow someone. That doesn't have a service to see that that prohibits someone that has to not see something. Right? So that's uh, that's just uh, how you you define your policy. Um, 
So there are, I mean, I wave you over on, beyond my time, but there are uh, other things that I, at least I want to mention uh, that EQ allows. So it allows you to do uh, fault tolerance. So the circuit breaking, so if you say, uh, I can wait seven seconds for this request. If after seven seconds I don't get a response, then the proxy will assume that it was not a successful response. So you can define that in the proxy level. You can define also rates. So you can say, this user, for example, can query three times uh, each second, you know, um, which is a lot related to API management solutions that we're doing today. Um, and many, many other things that uh, is UNN does. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll leave space time for maybe like one or two more questions, but I'm ready, but you know, on my time. Um, Envoy is part of Istio. Envoy is the proxy uh, that uh, does the control and sees the traffic. Uh, Istio is a larger umbrella project that contains Envoy as well, that uses Envoy as well. Yes. So, and I, I have not, but but uh, since let's say the use cases that I saw for Envoy, they were on a, I would say a fairly small number of services, microservices. At least I've heard published a hundred number, you know, lots of servers though, like, but a hundred microservices. That means that you likely need configuration for a hundred microservices or three hundred if you have multiple environments. For me, this is still a fairly small number, and I think it will go to the same. Uh, uh, let's say problems that Kubernetes went when they started to scale the number of objects in memory for things. You know, it's not 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 the not the workload, but the maintenance of the configuration of the cluster you know, using SVG and such. So because the limitations in 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 our Kubernetes clusters today, it's not it's it's the configuration, right? So how much configuration can you handle, and and how much consistency will play in that? You know. Um, I know, like, just be aware that this is very new technology. There's a, the, version, the current version of Istio is 0 0.16. Uh, it was, like, launched uh, uh, eight weeks ago. So still a lot to happen there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that's the idea of anyone that's doing this. I know IPG is thinking about this. I know people from Data Power that are here, they're thinking about this. Red Hat, we are thinking about this as well. You know, uh, it, it just doesn't make sense to have lots of proxies, right? To have one that already knows things, they can apply the same rates and limits that you would. I you essentially need a configuration tool on top of that to distribute user keys to to do billing, to do metering and such, but the proxy is already there. No need for another proxy or another gateway, we should use this word. So Kubernetes, so no, so Istio today runs in Kubernetes. So it uses Kubernetes to do service discovery, right? So if you have a Kubernetes service, that will be an Istio service. Um, Kubernetes services are DNS addressable, uh, although Istio does not and they does not use the service IP. It goes directly to IP of the pod, which is something that needs to be, in my opinion, looked on. Um, but uh, yeah, so service discovery, it's, it's, it's done via Kubernetes, essentially. It's, it's, the service registry is inside Kubernetes, actually. So, so when you deploy, uh, install Istio, and you have a service like uh, the service review, it's going to query Kubernetes and say, like, what are the pods that uh, have the label selector for the review service? And then you still have a list of pods and say, oh, so these are the people that are responding under Review service. Right? 
so that's how it knows. List of people, like list of pods that are responding on the user base. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, and, and and there is work to have meshes, network meshes that span different boundaries. You know, there's the boundary of the mesh that ends inside the Kubernetes cluster, uh, but there is work to expand ma boundary meshes and to even there's a, now there's a ideas to create mesh namespaces, for example, because uh, all mesh that I understand it's uh, it's not namespaced, so it's all part of the same. You define everything using policies, but there is not the concept of uh, mesh organization. So, so the, the 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 applications inside this mesh can see themselves and they can look up themselves. But the the, the, the applications inside this other organization can cannot see. Just like Kubernetes has namespaces to organize, I think there's uh, opportunity for namespaces in meshes as well. Especially, uh, just think of OpenShift Online. That uh, each project is its own namespace. Uh, of course, if you had a mesh, you wouldn't like people from other projects to see your your pods. It's very basic. But, uh, hopefully, I answered your question. One more, yes. I would say it's not a conflict, it's just uh, work that needs to be done because the technologies are new, but you are correct. So there's a cube, uh, cube, uh, cube proxy running in each Kubernetes node that uh, interacts through the IP tables from a, on a node level, right? But this was on a pod level, just have in mind. It's a different level, right? But this was on a pod level. So the cube proxy does it on a node level. Uh, and I, I do understand that there needs that there there's work that needs to be done there. Uh, uh, the cube proxy is actually not a proxy, for example. There's no traffic going through the cube proxy. It's just a, a management thing in the node you know, that controls and talks to the node and reports back to the API server. Good, thanks. I know I went over, but and the questions were good. So, Sridhar, next. <laughs> 